Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. That is who you are. 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 You are Jesus. That is who you are. Oh, Jesus. Oh, we love. Oh, you're our way maker, Jesus. You're our way maker, Jesus. We love.
dear God. Look at somebody tell them that's who he is. That's who he is. That's who he is. He's my way maker. He's my miracle worker. He's my promise. He's a light in the darkness. And even when I can't see it, he's still working. Even when I don't feel it, I just know he's still working. Hallelujah, because he's working all things together for my good. I just know it. Hallelujah, Jesus.
Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, we praise you in this place, God. We honor you, Lord God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord God. Oh, we give you glory, God. We give you glory, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, God.
your name, God. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. Continue to worship. Hallelujah. Amen. With the choir tonight. Oh, this is a great song. Thank you, Jesus.
Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. He gave me a reason to dance. Hallelujah. Gave me a reason to dance. He gave me a reason to dance. Hallelujah. Gave me a reason to dance. He gave me a reason to dance. Hallelujah. He gave me a reason to dance. So get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Come on. Get up, get up, get up. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. He gave me a reason to dance. Hallelujah. He gave me a reason to dance. Hallelujah. One more time. He gave me a reason to dance. Gave me a reason to dance. Amen. Oh, thank God. Thank God. Hallelujah. Thank God for that three weeks on the elliptical machine is all I got to say. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. On your, on your way back to your seat, tell somebody, he gave me a reason to dance. Because he picked me up, turned me around, placed my feet on solid ground. I think the master... I thank the Savior because he healed my heart, changed my name, forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior. I thank God. Yes, Lord. Woo. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Well, we're going to receive our tithes and our offerings. You just got to love it when God just blows up your whole plan, right? Good Lord. My God. How many of y'all already got some help this morning? Got some encouragement this morning. Joy this morning. Amen. Woo! Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank God. There is no place like the house of God. You go to a club, you might be able to dance something like this. But here we're dancing for the Lord. You can have fun in the world because sin is pleasure for a season. But there ain't nothing like the presence of the Lord because in his presence, there's fullness of joy. Woo. I want to remind you, Chandra, if you could pull up that graphic. Chandra, if you could pull up that graphic. We're raising money quickly to pay off our mortgage. We just bought this building about two and a half years ago. We've got a 15-year mortgage on it, but we're already down to $22,351. It's amazing. It's a miracle. But it's because people have just gave and gave. I mean, every once in a while, 10000 5000 And then many of you all in your ties, your offerings, giving to the building fund. But I believe with all my heart that if we will work hard and we, we will give all that we can, I believe we can get this building paid off even by summer. Amen. So we want to really give, if, if, if you would, help, help me. Just commit. If you can commit to $100 a month, just beyond your tithes and offerings, just 100 just for a few months. 
if we had 30, 40 people to do that, then saints of God, we pay off this building real quick. By July, by July, just $100, just $100. That's, uh, I, you notice now you go out to eat, if there's three or four of you, you're gonna spend that kind of money at a restaurant now. I mean, it is without fail. So don't go to eat one time a week. Just miss that one meal. And take those at 25, it's just $25 a week, really. And give. Maybe some of you can give more than that. Maybe some of you could give into the thousands of dollars. I don't know, whatever God would touch your heart. But let's get this property paid off. The bank's gonna really hate on us because they're gonna lose a whole bunch of interest, but that's all right. But I believe that God will do it. He's performed miracles for this church. And I don't ever come to this church with special offerings or pleading for money or begging for money because God just takes care of the need. But the Lord really put it on my heart at the beginning of this year that we need to get this building paid off quick. And maybe it's because God's gonna move us on to something bigger and we need to be able to sell this and make the profit and pay that, who knows? God can do that. The church is growing, God's touching people's hearts. And so if you're watching via live stream, I know that many watching can't be here. Amen. If this is part of your fellowship, if this is part of your church, amen, give. Bless the work of God. And I know that God will get back to you abundantly, saints. I don't, I don't have any promises of an uncommon seed or an uncommon harvest. I have no blesses, glasses of water from the Jordan to give you. Now, we've got several ways that we can give. Um, you can give through GiveLify. Sean, can you put up that slide? You can give through GiveLify. You can also now give through Cash App. Amen. I, I, you know, I wasn't for that, but then I had a bunch of young people come up to us at the conference and say, you don't have any other way for us to give? Cash App, Venmo, and I realized I am way behind the times. So you can give via Cash App, uh, just New Destiny KPT on your Cash App, and you can give that. You can give in person, give LaFi, or the P.O. Box is up there if you want to send in a check if you're coming from out of town. But I believe that God will bless us abundantly if we give. I know that God has. And some people say, well, you know, I just can't afford to, and you're never going to be able to. I can make you a promise. If you, if you rob from God, he will not rebuke the devourer. Everything will eat up. You know what he'll do? He'll take your money that you're supposed to be given, and he'll give it to a creditor. He'll give it to a mechanic. He'll give it to a plumber because he knows they'll go to church and give it. So you be better off to give it and just bless the Lord. Give abundantly, saints. I don't, I don't ask you to do anything I don't do. Sister Shonda and I have made a commitment as well to give toward the mortgage. We've got missions. Uh, when I'm able to do mission trips, that way we don't have to, I don't ever want this church to be under financial strain. It's just not, it's not appropriate for God's people to be under a financial strain. But if you just have a little extra every month, give. We've got missions. We've got a school uh, that we're, and, and I want to say this. We do not have to charge not one dime of tuition for our school. Not one dime. Because we have single mothers, we have people in our church who can't afford to give tuition. And because of the faithful giving of this church, we're able to support all you see. I'm full time. We're able to support the school. We, we've got so much going on. God, let me tell you something. God can do amazing things through his people. So don't, if, if you spent your whole life with your hand out, I want you to try God and put your hand forth. Instead of taking, give. And watch God bless you. If, you're, if, you're, if you've got a job, if you're working a job, every week, the first thing I do is I take my tithes out of my salary. It's 10% of your gross income. I just take it right out immediately. And I give it to the Lord because I don't want Cheddar's getting it. Come on, somebody. I don't want the convenience store getting it. I don't want the cable guy getting it. I want to make sure that the tithe, which, by the way, belongs to the Lord, goes to the Lord. Because I don't want to take from him. He's been too good to give to me. So we're going to give our tithes and our offerings again. You've got all kinds of ways you can give. Um, but when you give, don't give. Oh, here we go again. i got to give my offering. If you, if you have that mentality, God doesn't receive that. The Bible said the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Somebody who's just so full of joy giving, they laugh all the way to the offering plate. Please, Paul, we're begging you to take our offering is what the churches in Macedonia who were very poor said.
because they wanted to be a part of the ministry of giving. So we are going to minister to the Lord today in our giving. Isn't that awesome? It's a powerful thing. So, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for what you've already done in this place. We thank you for how you've moved. God, your presence has been amazing already this morning. But, Lord, now we get a chance to also minister to you in our giving. I pray, Lord, that you would bless those that have to give. Bless them abundantly as you watch over your word to perform it concerning them. And we will not cease to give you praise, but we will be careful to honor you in all of these things. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, brothers, come, saints, let's stand to our feet. Let's give to the Lord. Bible, and you can also read in the King James. Praise God. The Bible said, Moses talked there with the Lord and said unto him, ye have been telling me, take these people to the promised land, but you haven't told me who you will send with me. You say you are my friend and that I have found favor before you. Please, if this is really so, guide me clearly along the way you want me to travel so that I will understand you. And will walk acceptably before you. For don't forget that this nation is your people. And the Lord replied, I myself will go with you and give you success. For Moses had said, if you aren't going with us, don't let us move a step from this place. If you don't go with us, who will ever know that I and my people have found favor with you? And that we are different from any other people upon the face of the earth. And the Lord replied to Moses, yes, I will do what you have asked, for you have certainly found favor with me, and you are my friend. I want to preach to you just for a few moments tonight from this subject. If you don't, go with me. If you don't, go with me. Moses said, Lord, you know, I'll... I'll go and do what you asked me to do. You've asked me to do this, and I, I'll do it. But, Lord, I'm not moving a step if you don't go with me. Father God, in the name of Jesus, 
We thank you for your anointing, for your power, for your presence. We thank you for the glory of God that we have felt in this house. But Lord, now we have come to the breaking of the bread of your word. And Lord, all of that was preparing us for this moment. Lord, that we might hear the engrafted word of God, which is able to save our souls. God, touch my mouth and my mind. God, anoint me, especially God, that no one would hear from Jared, but Lord, they would hear from Jesus. For you are the word of God. So speak in this place as only as you can. And I will give you praise, glory, and honor for it all. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. You could be seated in the presence of the Lord. God has done a powerful miracle. He took the children of Israel and he brought them out with a mighty hand. Three and a half million of them out of the house of Egypt, out from under the yoke of bondage, out from the whip of the taskmaster. He brought them out by a mighty hand. He showed himself powerful and strong as only as he can. And that was wonderful. He's leading them with a cloud by day, fire by night. That's wonderful. But now the Lord is getting ready to ask Moses to take the children of Israel across the Jordan and into Canaan to the promised land. And Moses realized this is going to be a daunting task. And God said, you know what? He said, I'm going to send my angel before you. And I'm going to give you victory over all the ites of the land. Moses was not satisfied with an angel. He said, Lord, if you don't go with us, I'm not moving another step. And sometimes coming up out of Egypt, and Egypt in our, in our day and age would be a type of sin, we think, well, I, 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 I'm, I've given my life to the Lord. I'm repentant now. I'm, I'm good to go. And we, we think that's our final destination is just repenting of sin. But we have to understand that that moment of repentance that moment that we acknowledge Jesus Christ as the Son of God really is just the beginning of a journey. It is not the culmination of one. It is the starting of the path. And if we're not careful, that will get into our spirit and we'll think, well, because I have, I, I've repented, I'm good to go. Everything's fine now. I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. I, I don't have any other thing to do, but I'm going to tell you something. The acknowledgement of the Lord in your life and the repenting of sin is only a step in your journey with Jesus Christ. It is not your final destination. And so we have to understand that. And we have to understand because of that, from the time that we, <laughs> that we give our life unto the Lord and we repent and we confess him to be son of God, from that moment, we are desperately needing God to be heavily involved in our life. I know that sometimes we think that because we've done that, that everything should be a fairy tale from here on out. But the fact of the matter is, serving the Lord sometimes Though it's, though it's the best thing you can do, it can become difficult. There are trials along the way. There are hardships that we have to face along the way. And the fact of the matter is we cannot do it by ourselves. And if we are not careful, saints of God, we will spend most of our life trying to go at this alone. And, it, and, and it's, 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 it's almost insanity because we have to realize after all of our experience that there is no way that we left under ourselves can do anything that is profitable. I think that we've all made enough mess of our life throughout the years to realize that we on our own are a horrible tragedy waiting to happen to us over and over and over again. And so we have to be careful that we don't get prideful. Sometimes pride can come into our hearts and we think that, well, I, I gotta be independent. I have to go at this alone. But the worst thing you can be is alone. Come on, somebody. And alone doesn't necessarily mean we're not in a crowd. Have you ever been in a crowd of people? I mean, people all around you, people talking to you, greeting you, and you felt like there was nobody there but you. You were all by yourself in a crowd, completely alone. Come on, somebody. Being alone also does not mean that your spouse isn't there. Sometimes you can be married and your spouse be there with you every day, but feel alone. Your spouse care about you, love you, talk to you, but you still feel alone. Alone also isn't necessarily the absence of family or friends. 
And see, I, 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 I want you to understand this because sometimes we think if I can just marry the right woman, if I can just get around the right friends, if I can just, if I can just have my family around me, then I will never feel alone. But the one thing that I have found over the years is when God is not in my life, it doesn't matter who's around me, I am alone. I'm all by myself. I love my family, I love my friends, I love my wife, but if God is not in the midst of my life, I know good and well I am all alone because my family will have to leave my house at some time. My friends will have to leave my company at times and my spouse will have to sleep at night. And the fact of the matter is maybe some of you in here, you just watch your spouse sleep at night because you're waking up all hours of the night and though they're, sit, they're laying right beside you, you know that though there's two people in this bed, I am all alone. That is because God's wanting you to know that without him, you are alone. Without him, you are alone. Because people will fail you. Friends will walk away from you. Family members will pass away. Even spouses will go the way of the grave. And you have got to find a way for you to be in a, in a position where it's just you and nobody else, but you are not alone. I have been driving down the road at times, saints of God, and I knew that I was not alone. I've been in my car praying and, and talking to God. I'm talking hours of drives, hundreds of miles, all by myself on my way to minister somewhere. And I'm just talking to the Lord the whole time that I'm traveling. And I know that though there's not another human being in that car with me, I am not alone. Because the Lord made me a promise that he would not leave me nor forsake me, but he would be with me always, even unto the end of the world. And sometimes also we can believe that if we have the right job or we have the right finances, if we have the right possessions, uh, then people will look upon us as if we are something. And I want to tell you something. Possessions do not validate you. Money does not validate you. The fact of the matter is the more possessions and the more money you have, you may, be, you may have a lot of people who want to be around you, but you will find out real quick when the possessions and the money are no longer there that you are really all alone. When David sinned against God and he committed adultery with Bathsheba and he had Uriah killed, David knew that there was a problem here when Nathan came to him and, and he told him of, of, of the parable and David thought he was talking about some shepherd in the field but Nathan looks at him and says you're the man, you're the one who had the shepherd killed, you're the one who stole his ewe lamb, you're the man and David realized right there oh God, I am in a dire strait here because there is a potential if I don't get this right I am going to live the rest of my life in a palace with people with servants with guards and soldiers but I will be all alone and so he tell, clothes himself in sackcloth and in ashes and he goes outside to the gate of the city and he said Lord against thee and against thee only have I committed this sin have I done this iniquity in your sight he said oh God create in me a clean heart Oh God and renew the right spirit within me he said cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me he didn't ask God to keep the palace he didn't ask God to keep his family he didn't ask God to keep people he just said Lord don't let me lose your presence because if I don't have you I'll be in this palace and all alone I'll be in a table with hundreds but all alone I'll be in a throne room with thousands but Lord if you are not there. So he didn't ask the Lord to preserve his possessions. He just asked the Lord, don't send me away from your presence because I can afford to lose people. But if I lose you, I will be all alone. Lord, I can, I can afford to let this palace go. But if you take your Holy Spirit from me, who then will I have? Hallelujah. His greatest fear was to be in a palace but not to be in God's presence. It's his greatest fear. To have all kinds of subjects but not ever again feel God's spirit. Saints of God, we've got to get to that place where we stop pursuing stuff as a means to affirm ourselves 
And we start to realize that, my God, I could be in the middle of a jungle in a cave somewhere, but if God is there, I am not by myself. If the presence of the Lord goes with me, I am not alone. Look at your neighbor and tell him, don't be alone. Don't be alone. Jesus said it this way. He said the man, that a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. That's not where your life is. And so I know that there are a lot of us that think that the bling is going to get us notoriety, that if we have the right glasses on, if we have the right chain on, if we have the right rings on, if we have, if we have the right name brand of clothing on, then that's going to give us the validation we need. But it doesn't take long. As you mature as a human being and you come out of that childish state and you begin to grow up and into adulthood, you start to realize that it's not the stuff that makes the man. You start to realize that it's not the possessions that gives me the clout. You start to understand, especially a child of God, that it is in him I live, it is in him I move, and it is in him I have my being. If the Lord is not with me, that's just stuff. If the Lord, it, oh God, let me tell you something, when the Lord came to find Saul you know where he was hiding he was hiding in the stuff and there's a lot of us that have been hiding in the stuff for a long long time but I want to call you out tonight and tell you come up out of the stuff the stuff is not what makes you a real man the stuff is not what makes you a real woman it is Jesus and Jesus alone that can make you what you need to be Now, you have to understand that being absent from God is not always a result of blatant sin or rebellion. It can also be a result of you not seeking God for the next move or decision of your life. There's so many of us, we are impulsive in our decision making or we're prideful. I'm grown. Ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. I'm, I'm, I'm my own man. I, I'm my own woman. There's nobody. I'm making my own way. It is in that mentality that you will be absent from the presence of the Lord because God doesn't exist in your way because you have to understand the Lord is the way, the truth, and the life. And so you have to understand that sometimes people think, well, the only way for me to get out of God's presence is for me to commit some act of blatant sin or some horrible act of rebellion. And that's what will do it. But sometimes it's just you doing your own thing your own way. Come on. Doesn't have to be sin. Just you willfully going about life your own way without ever seeking God. You willfully making all kinds of decisions without ever praying. James said, don't say I will go here and I will go that, there. He said, you say if the Lord wills, I will go here and I'll go there. In other words, before I make the move, Lord, I'm going to seek you. Solomon said this in Proverbs 3 and verse 5 through 7. He said, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In other words, don't you ever think that you're smart enough to decide for God what is good for you. You must remember that I believe Jeremiah is the one that spoke as God spoke through him and said, I have plans for you, plans to prosper you, plans to give you hope in a future. He said, I do not have plans to harm you. So why am I suffering? Because most of the time you're living by your plan. In God's plan, it is prospering. It doesn't mean necessarily money. It doesn't mean necessarily houses or cars. I'm talking about sometimes prosperity is just peace of mind. Sometimes the blessing of the Lord is just having some joy in your heart. Sometimes the prosperity is just waking up in the morning and being glad that you saw another day. Sometimes it's just leaping up out of the bed knowing this is the day that the Lord has made. I will be glad and rejoice in it. He said, in all your ways, acknowledge him. Lord God, in everything I do, I'm going to first seek you because I don't want to be leading my life. I've done that for a long time and I have found enough destruction to realize that I am not great enough, I am not smart enough, I am not intellectual enough, I don't have the means enough, I'm not powerful. 
powerful enough. If I am in control, God, everything's out of control. But one thing I have learned is if God gets in control, he will bring peace. He will bring joy. Come on, somebody. Good God in heaven because there is peace. There is joy, saints of God. There is a life in the Holy Ghost. He said, if you will not lead your own understandings, but in all your ways acknowledge me, I'll direct your paths. Those plans I have for you, you'll see them. That, 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 that prosperity I have for you, you'll receive it. That hope that is yet before you, you will realize it. Because I have plans for you. Quit making your plans. Seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near and ask the Lord God, what is your will for my life? I want you to remember, saints of God, that never, while Jesus was in the garden, battling in his flesh with this future that was yet before him, while he was battling, God did nothing to help him. For an hour he prayed until the Bible said that he came under such stress that his skin began to open and he sweat as it were great drops of blood. He was absolutely at the peak of anxiety. He was completely stressed out and God for an hour did nothing. He comes out of the garden and he looks at his disciples. You can't even pray with me for an hour. I'm in here stressing out. You don't know what's about to happen and I can't even count on you. That's the reason why I told you. People can be with you, but you could be all alone. Hallelujah, because God let a sleep fall upon them and they went to sleep and Jesus was struggling all by himself and God was doing nothing. But there came a moment Jesus said, I'm doing it. Exactly the Father's will because that's what I do. I do all those things that please my Father. And so he went into that garden. I'm telling you, the victory that Jesus wrought was not on the cross. Jesus won the victory in the garden because it was in the garden he decided this is going to be God's way. This is it. I'm doing this. There's no turning back now. And he goes and he says, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, come on. He had prayed this prayer many times for an hour and God did nothing but this time he was absolutely sold out that God's plan was the best. He was going to do it. No more fear, no more anxiety, no more worry. He wasn't going to fear those things that came upon him. Why? Because he knew from the moment I leave this garden until I hang on that cross, he's going to be with me. He's going to be every step of the way with God. And the Bible said, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And the Bible said that God immediately sent forth angels and strengthened him. Maybe some of you right now are without strength. Maybe you're struggling to keep your head up. Maybe anxiety is overcoming you, overwhelming you. But most of the time, that's a red light going off in your life saying, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will. Somebody look at your neighbor, tell him he will direct your path. He will direct your path. He said, be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Amen. Humility is an open door for God to do miraculous things in and through your life. Humility is so powerful. You know us guys when we're young. Man, we're full of vim and vinegar, and we, we got all kinds of pride, and we're going to take over the world. I mean, we, we are in, we're, I mean, we are absolutely immortal. We are undefeatable. I mean, come on. Get around a bunch of men talking about their high school days. They were all track stars, basketball stars. Every one of them were one injury away from professional sports. <laughs> Because when you are young, you are invincible. You can conquer anything. But then you live a little bit. And it's not long after you've lived a while. 40 years now into my life, I realize that I can do nothing of my own self. Hallelujah. God has got to be working in my life. 
if I am ever to do anything that makes any memorable impact in the life of those that are around me. I need the Lord. Because saints of God, we are but dust. The Bible said our life is as a vapor. It is here today and then tomorrow it is gone. That's how fragile we are. And so while we're boasting our strength, let us all remember that if it's not for God, we are very fragile. I think if this, I think if this time in our society has taught us anything, it's how fragile life really is. And that if it's not for the Lord, there's none of us that can conquer or accomplish anything. Humility before God will make you the great leader in every of your, area of your life that God has given to you. Let's talk about this, saints. Because some of us are husbands. Some of us are fathers. Wives, mothers, bosses. When you walk into a situation and you think, I got this figured out. It didn't take me long to think... To, to realize that as a husband, I did not know how to be a husband. I thought when I married my wife, I had it down. I had all the scriptures. I did, had them memorized. Especially that one when it says, you know, that Sarah honored Abraham and called him Lord. I, I had that one, I had that one down. Amen. <laughs> Listen here, woman, you subject yourself to your own husband. Thank you. But it doesn't take you long to figure out that, God, if you don't help us, I can't be the husband I need to be. I thought as a father I was going to be the superhero. I thought I was going to wear the red cape and have the big S on my, on my, on my chest, and I was going to be able to do anything. I was, going to be, I was going to be able to conquer all of the adversaries that would come against my children. Every hardship that would come into their life, I was going to be the one to absolutely put it down so that they would never have to suffer or want or lack until... I became a father, and the first time they ran a fever that I couldn't do anything about. The first time they had to go into the hospital and I couldn't heal them. Come on, somebody. When they got into their teenage years and I couldn't smack them enough to quit smart-mouthing me. <laughs> I had to realize that, God, without you, I can't be the father that I need to be. And it is the same way in your sister's lives. Without God, how could you be the wife and the mother that you need to be? At best, we are carnal. And with our best intentions, we are fraught with failure. Have you ever been in a situation and think, God, I can't do nothing right? You ever had your spouse look at you and say, I can't do nothing right. No matter how much I do for you, I can't do nothing right. And sometimes the reality of that is, is because we are trying by our own strength and our own power to do what only God can help us accomplish in our life. And so there has to be humility. We have to go before God and acknowledge that we are but grass. We are but dust. Lord, without you, we cannot do anything. We are completely incapable of anything good if, God, you are not involved directly in our life. And so instead of us going into our homes and trying to strong arm success in our homes, come on, somebody. Some of y'all have gotten in trouble because you had to have it your way. It had to look your way. Come on, somebody. It had to go your way. You had to have the stuff just right. It had to look a certain way because God forbid bit anybody would look at you and look at the stuff you have and not think that wow there must be something really wonderful about that person because they're wearing Gucci and Armani and they're driving the nicest cars and have the biggest house and look at their children my God I don't even know what the latest fashion for the children are but oh if they're not in then, then they're not nobody God forbid God would humble you and crush you and put you to the bottom until he lets you know it was not that stuff that made you anything. I was the one who was there providing. I was the one who was helping. And sometimes God's trying to crush us and we're pushing them back against him. Sometimes you just got to let the weight fall on you. Come on. Because you will either fall upon the rock and break, or Jesus said, the rock will fall upon you and grind you into powder. You say, what is the difference between pieces and powder at the time of restoration? It takes a whole lot less time to put pieces together than it does powder. There are some of you that are one decision away from months of restoration or years of restoration. Well, how do I know? Seek the Lord while he may be found. 
can call upon him while he is near. Peter said this in 1 Peter 5 and 6. He said, humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. A lot of times you hear this quote, it'll say, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you. No, no, no. It says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that. That means the condition of him exalting you is tied to you humbling yourself before him. We've got to drop the ego and the pride. It doesn't make us anything. We just bolster ourselves to only, listen, we do it in public because we're, we're, we're putting up defense mechanisms. We don't want anybody to know what we really feel about ourselves, so we walk around in bravado. We walk around in power. We walk around like we've got it all together. We've got our head up in the air, and we're walking around as a professional, and everything looks wonderful and good. But really, we're only doing that so nobody can see the broken man that is hiding behind the, oh, come on, somebody that's hiding behind the costume that you have put on. Because outwardly you're trying to show yourself strong, but if people could look past your mask, if they could see past your costume, they would see you groveling, needing help, but not humble enough to say, Lord, it is you that I need. Take the stuff, but don't take your spirit. If the possessions have to go, that's great, but don't take your power. Because, Lord, I'll suffer the loss of all things. If it means that I can gain you. We must acknowledge honestly and transparently the messes we have made in our lives when God was not calling the shots. Be honest about it. How many of you all could say absolutely honestly today, God, my life has been a horrible mess because you weren't calling the shots. I was doing it my way. Frank Sinatra was wrong, saints, and he's going to learn that at the lake of fire. He did it his way. And that's the wrong way to do it. Not my will. Lord, your will. My God, the next time somebody writes that, let him write it, I did it his way. Not I did it my way, I did it his way. Because there are two phrases you're going to hear at the judgment seat. It's either going to be, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I never knew you, or you're going to hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. Well, how am I faithful over a few things? Because you followed my plan. Because you engaged my will and you didn't walk away from me. Glory to God. Glory to God. I'm telling you, this church is filled with people that God has restored from absolute ruin. This church is filled with people who were, when they finally, when they finally acknowledged the God who had been touching them for years, trying to get them to turn, they all of a sudden realized, why did I waste so many years? Because living for Jesus is better than anything I ever lived before. Glory to God. He's my help. He's my shield and my buckler. The name of the Lord is my strong tower. I run into it and I can hide. Good God. He's my provider. He, oh God. He's the prince of peace. He's my wonderful counselor. Good God. And the only way to come to that place is to get to the place in your own life where you say, Lord, I know when I was calling the shots. I mean, and some of y'all say, well, I, I've been saved since I was in Sunday school at nine years old. Doesn't mean you're walking with God. Because remember, coming up out of Egypt is just the start of the journey. It's not your final destination. Hallelujah. I have flown all over this world, and, 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 and when you, there are times I've had to hit four flights just to get to a certain country. And they'll, the first leg of the flight, I would fly from maybe Charlotte to London. And they would say, those of you that are stopping here in London, this will be your final destination. For those of you that will be traveling on from here, please look at the screens as you go into uh, the terminal and find your next flight. And every step of the way, I knew I'm flying now to Kenya. So London can't be my final destination. And then we'd fly from London to maybe Amsterdam and we'd stop at Amsterdam and they would say, for those of you that are traveling to Amsterdam, this is your final destination. But for those of you that will be traveling on from here, please look at the screens in the terminal to find your next flight. It wasn't until 
I got on the plane and we were coming in to Nairobi in Kenya that I heard my stop. For those of you that are traveling to Kenya, this will be your final destination. And I knew that at that moment, my trip had come to an end and I was where I was supposed to be. There are some of you all that are still in the terminal in London when God's trying to get you to Nairobi. You think that just because you got on the first plane and you hit the first stop that this is the final destination. But I want to tell you, your final destination is when you look at his face and you know that that is the one whom your soul loves and you are with him. So don't think because you were saved at nine years old in Sunday school that you have hit your final destination. Maybe for some people it's their final destination, but for those of you that are traveling on to the kingdom, my God, we are yet to another journey. We are yet on another trip. We are yet to another path. Glory to God. And you cannot be the pilot. You can't be the one directing the plane. You can't be the one deciding how to get there. How awful would it be? How horrible would it be if, 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 if the pilot came back to me who has never, ever, I've never even seen the inside of a cockpit before and say, uh, passenger, uh, I'm really tired of flying here. So, so why don't you get in there and you take the controls? Say, well, where, where, would, where would the end of that flight be? To the scene of the crash. <laughs> That's exactly where we'd stop is, right at the scene of the crash. And most of us, that's the problem. We keep grabbing the controls. Well, Lord, this, wait a minute. Wait, I, I, I know that I'm on my way to the kingdom. But this is not the path I thought I was going to take. I, I know that I, I'm on my way to see Jesus, but this is not the flight path that I thought that I was going to be on. And so we say, Lord, move aside. Let me grab the controls. I know how to get there. And what happens? We crash. So maybe some of you all, yes, you may have given your life to the Lord. You may have confessed your sins. You may have acknowledged him as the son of God when you were in Sunday school at nine years old, and that's wonderful. But there's a whole lot of people that have found themselves getting on that plane only to end up at the scene of the crash. But what I love about God is God has this incredible ability to swoop down, pitch, pick you back up, and put you once again on the proper path. <laughs> Hallelujah! He has the incredible way at repentance. He has the incredible way at the moment that you confess your sin. And he has the incredible way at the moment that you turn back to him and say, Lord, I was wrong. I should have never taken control of this. I was wrong. I should have never had the controls in my hand. Lord, I was the one who was at fault. God, I should have never. I, I, I knew that I needed you all along. But, Lord, I'm the one who has made the, I'm the one who has made the calls. And look at the mess I made. At that moment, the Lord will swoop you back up and he will put you back on on the right path. There has to be a moment that we acknowledge that God, I can't change without you. I can't be the husband, the wife, the child, the boss, the teacher. I can't hear myself, brothers. The employee. I can't be anything that is right if you're not right there with me. I can't be who you're calling me to be if you are not with me. I want to be the right husband, but I can't be if you're not with me. I want to be a proper wife, but I can't if you're not with me. I, I, I wanna, as a child, I wanna be, I wanna honor my parents, but I can't if you're not with me. I, I want to be the right boss at work, but I can't 
if you're not with me. I want to be the right minister, but I can't if you're not with me. I, I want to be. I, I really want to be what is right. But Lord, I can't if you're not with me. I know that you've called me, you have plans for me, but I can't accomplish my assignment if you don't go with me. I can have all the skills, the ability, and the talent, but Lord, if you don't go with me, I'll fail this thing. And I've failed so many times before, I just cannot fail again. Lord, I don't want to take another step if you don't go with me. God, I can't step into my calling nor fulfill it if you don't go with me. Lord, I don't want to do anything in my life if you're not with me. I've done it all by myself and I've made a horrible mess of it. I've hurt my wife. I've hurt my husband. I've not been honorable to my children. I've been a bad employee, terrible boss. I've not been a faithful child of God. I've ignored you. You've not been in my life, but only in times of crisis and tragedy because it was the crisis and tragedy that showed me that I can't do this if you're not with me. I want to call to some of you all this morning, and maybe maybe you're that person that has just kind of done your own thing. Did it your way, had it your way, and suffered because of it. You can't seem to find a way to move forward. You can't seem to find a way to take a step forward. You, 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 as you go one step forward, ten steps backward. I mean, every time you want to do right, you want to do it. Lord, I really want to do it the right way. I, I, maybe, maybe that's the problem. You're not saying, Lord. You're just saying, I want to do it the right way. But without the Lord with you, you're never, ever going to accomplish what you desire in your heart. You'll always be the failure that society, culture, maybe even parents told you that you were. But I'm going to tell you something. God has an incredible ability to turn you completely around and to make you, listen, the Bible said that when the spirit of the Lord fell upon Saul, it turned him into another man. Maybe some of you in here tonight, I just feel it in, or today, I just feel it in my heart. Some of you need to say, Lord, I've done it my way. Maybe you've been offended. Maybe that's why you've just kind of been going through the motions because you got hurt or offended. And so your whole life has been a series of offenses, a series of hurts, a series of wounds. And a lot of times it's because of what we have done to ourselves, not necessarily what others have done to us. But maybe it is. Maybe you've been church hurt. Maybe you just decided, I'm just not, I'm never going to be, I'm not going to do this again because I will not be hurt again. But you have to stop making decisions because you're offended. You have to stop making decisions because you're wounded. You have to start saying, Lord, if you don't go with me, I know what it feels like for you not to be there. But I also know what it feels like for you to be there. I can't be alone anymore, Lord. I don't want to leave this church today if you're not with me. I don't want to take another step forward if you're not with me. I cannot afford to leave this place the man or the woman that I walked in here. I want to come back to you. I want to come to you. I want to live before you. I want to walk before you. I want you to make me what you want me to be because I want to see the plan of God played out in my life but I can't do it if you don't go with me I want us to stand our feet all over this place
There's a very wonderful anointing in this house right now. Because God's after some folks today that will say, Lord, I need you in my life again. I want, you, I want you in my life like I had you in my life when I first called on your name. When I was when I was on fire, when I was serving you, when I was living for you, and I felt your love and I felt your presence and I knew that you were in my life. I want to go back to that place because God, where I'm at right now, is not where I know that you have planned for me to be. And if you're in this place, I'm going to pray. If you're in this house and that's you, I want you to make your way to this altar. And I want to pray for you because I want to see God do great things in your life. Amen. Come on, come on, come on. We'll pray. If that's you, if that's you, you say, Pastor Jared, I'm, I'm that one. I want God back in my life. I want the Lord involved in my life. I'm tired of being what I've been. I want to see everything that God has for me. I want to see the plans that God has for me in my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to come back to the Lord. I want to serve him. I want to live for him again. I want to, I want to give him all that I am. Because I don't want to go another step if you're not with me. All right, saints of God, those of you who will come help us pray.
change of clothes. That's all right. We got you covered. We got you covered. If you would like, if the Bible says if, if you fall away, repent, do your first works again. Maybe some of you in here need to be baptized. You say, Lord, as a confession, Lord, as a, as a symbol, Lord God, of a purified conscience. The Lord just put it on my heart yesterday to fill up the baptism. If you need to be baptized, we've got clothes for you. We've got towels. If you need to be baptized, I want to give you a moment to be able to do that. If that's something that you would like to do. Lord, I want as an outward confession, God, of what you are doing in my life, I want to be baptized in your name. Then I want to give that to you as an opportunity. I'm going to let Sister Hannah play. If you would like to have that, I'm going to speak with each of you, but we don't worry about clothes. We got you covered. All right, we got you covered. We'll take care of that. Go ahead. Chad is going up, and he's going to get baptized here in just a moment, saints. Amen. We're excited about that. The Bible said there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that comes to repentance than over thousands that need none. So heaven is rejoicing today. Amen. Amen. For any of you that would like to tonight, we'll keep the water warm as well. But I believe this is a very important step in your walk with God. The Bible said it is an answer of a pure conscience before the Lord. And in 2 Peter 2, they said, they were pricked in their hearts and they said, what shall we do? And he said, repent 
and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then if you go to Simon's house, or not Simon, but Cornelius' house, after they had repented, the Holy Ghost had fell on them, then Peter commanded them to take them and baptize them in the name of the Lord. And so that's what we're going to get to do today. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Chad, this is a powerful moment in your life, brother. The Bible says, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins. Your past is gone, my friend. Don't hold it against yourself no more. Don't sit there and live in regret. From here on, it's the Lord. From here on, it's a powerful and a glorious future for you. All right? So don't ever let the enemy come into your life and be like, man, you know how bad, you know how much you failed. You know, we all have failed and come short of the glory of God. That's why I told you you're in the house of friends, brother. You know, nobody's got stones here. But right now, what you're about to do is an incredible moment in your life. Yesterday is gone, my friend. A new day has come. When you come up out of that water, you know in your heart that yesterday has completely gone away from you. God's going to forget about it completely. He's not going to bring it back anymore. He's going to cast it as far from him as the east is from the west to remember it no more. And from this point on, you be the child of God you need to be. All right. So, Chad, in obedience to the word of God, it is our honor to baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins. You shall receive the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord. Yeah.
God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh God. I am clean. Everybody glad you're clean. Praise God. All right, Brooke Abram, come up here. Amen. 
It's their birthday. Abram's birthday is tomorrow. Brooke, your birthday is today. All right. Amen. All right, y'all ready? Here we go. Happy birthday to you and you. Happy birthday to you and you. Happy birthday, dear Brooke and Abram. Happy birthday to you. All right, let's get Pentecostal. Oh, happy birthday to you. Oh, happy birthday to you. May you find Jesus near every day of the year. Oh, happy birthday to you. Oh, happy birthday to you. And the best one you've ever had. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Well, Chad, we're rejoicing with you today, man. Amen. Amen. The Bible said, if any man be in Christ, he is indeed a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Amen. Hallelujah. So this is a new walk for you, a new life for you. Amen. Glory to God. Thank God for that. I want to remember that tomorrow at 12 o'clock, Sister Leslie's nonprofit Blessings Pantry is going to be open, and we are going to do it a uh, big, all right? So everybody that can tomorrow, if you can be at uh, 2038 Fort Henry Drive here in Kingsport at 12 o'clock tomorrow, please be there. And you say, I have no clue where that's at. It's the old Papa John's Pizza Place, all right? That's where it is. You all know, right beside the mall, right across from it. That's where it's at, all right? Um, we want to remember that women's prayer is going to be this Tuesday at 6.30. Uh, family fun night is going to be February the 25th at 6.30. Let's all be here for that. Enjoy a wonderful time together. The Brainton, Florida meeting is going to be March the 10th through the 12th. So let's remember that. Um, want to continue to remember Gavin in our prayers. Really just keep Gavin in your prayers, all right? He's got a lot of issues that he's struggling with. Um, I want to pray for Sister Tammy Rutledge, Sister Terry. Um, also, uh, Travis Ketron, we want to pray for him. Uh, Xander's friend Dylan, we want to pray for him. Uh, thank God Sister Shonda is with us this morning. Amen. We also want to remember Sister Rochelle's mother, Wendy. Uh, I'm going to call him Brother Big Al. That's what I'm going to call him, Brother Big Al. And, Sister Mary Lou in Dakota, just miss them. Looking forward to them being able to be back in the house of God. Sister Rose Williamson is doing much, much better. She's just continuing to recover as God is helping her. So we want to continue to remember her in our prayers. Uh, Sister Mary Manning, uh, Brother Walt, Sister Rindy Johnson in Des Moines, Iowa. We want to continue to remember Brother Calvin uh, and Brother Calvin's orthopedic guy. All right. So he's sick and not feeling well. So we want to pray for him. Because Brother Calvin needs some adjustments done uh, on, on his uh, prosthesis. And he's been sick, so he hadn't been able to do that. So we need to pray that that guy gets healed real quickly. I am missing Brother Calvin being here. Brother Earl? Okay. Thank God. All right, Sister Rindy. Amen. What a testimony. What a testimony. We thank God for touching her and bless her. I, I keep telling her, I want to see her here. So God's going to just have to heal her till she can get here. Amen. Praise God. So glad that everyone has been in the house of God tonight or today. I keep saying tonight. Man, I, I must have everything. I have been up since very early this morning, so maybe that's the... Uh, I'm just getting ready. Listen, any of you parents, if your children repented on Wednesday and they haven't been baptized in the name of Jesus, bring them here tonight. Let's get that done. Amen. They, I mean, that was heartfelt stuff. It wasn't, if you were there Wednesday, you would understand. There were tears shed. It wasn't anything simple. And I, I, I just really, parents, I just don't really understand them. Your child's going to repent on Wednesday and then you don't show up in church on Sunday. It just blows my mind. 
it blows my mind. I can't figure this stuff out. And we can say, oh, we're not feeling well and we're sick. But if it don't keep you from traveling, if it don't keep you from the store, the restaurant, shopping, or anything else, it should not keep you out of the house of God. That's nothing but a bunch of excuses is all it is. It's a stronghold that oftentimes has been in people's life for years. And we need to pray that God will break that stronghold. It's a lying spirit is what it is. Amen. We want to get our children saved. We want to get, raise them in the house of God. This world ain't got nothing for them. Amen. I know that was tight, but it was right. I want to pray for Sister Kimberly Rogers. She has requested prayer too. And of course, uh, Matthew and Shauna, we, you know, we really don't need visitor cards for you guys. I was reading, I was like, wait a minute, I know these people. But we're so glad you guys are here anyways, you know, always. But it is just so good to be here. So glad that God has worked in many of your lives. All right. Yeah. 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 And you know what? God will sustain her just as long as she's supposed to live. I've seen God miraculously do that. But my aunt has been very close to me. She's very close to me. I, I, I love her. She was uh, very instrumental in my childhood. My parents both worked. And so I spent a lot, a lot of time in Illinois over at my aunt's when I was growing up. And so I want to see her here. Amen. If she's, got, if, if she's got some more time left, Lord, let her have it with us. We also want to remember um, uh, Larry Cox, right? Is that correct? Sister Jody's father, we want to remember him in our prayers that God would just continue to touch him. Is he having a good day today? All right, okay. Blood works better. We want to continue to remember him in our prayers, Brother Jimmy. All right, Brother Jimmy's Aunt Diana, we want to remember that in our prayers. All right, saints of God, this has been an awesome day. I can't wait to get back here tonight. I would miss tonight for nothing. I'm just telling you, if you've got to make a little sacrifice to be here, make a little sacrifice to be here. It's going to be awesome tonight. I don't know what God's going to do, but after a service like this, man, I mean, that was totally unplanned. I just want you all to know, we did not stage that thing. We were just trying to get through that song so Sister Hannah could start worshiping. God was like, no, i got a better plan. Aren't you glad God had a better plan? Amen? All right, Brother David, come dismiss us in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we're just so grateful. God, so grateful, God, this morning, God, for your spirit, Lord. God, we thank you, Lord. God, nothing else will do but you, oh God. Nothing else will do but you, God. And we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for the service. God, we thank you for the power and the anointing and the word of God, Lord, that's come forth this morning. God, let us hide it deep, deep down into our hearts, Lord, and go with us, oh God, today. Lord, and be with us, God, and, and encourage us, God, and strengthen each and every one of us, God, and heal those that need healed and deliver those that need to be delivered, God, and set free those that need to be set free. But, but God, in every way, be with us, God, and strengthen us, God, in our coming in and in our going out, God. Be with us in every way. God, and we pray for tonight's service, oh God, that you would be with us tonight, God. Lord, we pray that you would show up and show out, God, tonight. God, we pray for an outpouring and a manifestation, God, of the Holy Ghost. God, we pray tonight, God, that shackles and fetters would be broke loose. Chains would be set free this, this tonight, God, we pray. And God, we love you, Lord, and let us never fail, but God, to give you all the praise, honor, and glory because it's ever worthy to your name because you're good and your mercy endures forever. God, and we love you. In the name of Jesus, we praise you. Amen.